Good morning students and here is another video on fluids and uh, this is summer 2022. I hope you make good use of this video. So here we go we begin with the definition of uh, pressure. Pressure, as you know, is force by area. Force by area. So if you have a bigger force acting on a smaller area, you're going to have a big pressure. The best example is when you try to cut something with a knife. You're applying a certain force, but that force is acting on a very small area because the knife edge is sharp. So when you say it's sharp, you mean to say that the area is small, therefore the pressure is big. There are other examples like if you're trying to push a thumbtack into a cardboard or soft wood, you're applying a certain force. Again, that force is acting at the tip of the thumbtack, which has a tiny area, and therefore the pressure is quite big. That explains why it easily slides into the soft wood. The unit of pressure is Pascal. Newton per meter squared is also called Pascal. So that's the fundamental idea of pressure. As we move on, we have to look at the pressure exerted by a fluid. So let's say that there is a certain fluid. So what I mean by fluid could be a liquid or gas. In this case, it's a liquid. So you have this liquid in a certain container, like a beaker, and the area of the uh, base is A. The area is A, and the height of the liquid is H. So we can calculate the mass of the liquid in this container. You know mass is volume multiplied by density. And so the volume is A times H which makes the mass A times H times density, which is rho right here. And then you can get the weight because weight is mass multiplied by G. So the weight is the force. And this force is acting on the area of the base. So when you divide A H rho G by the area, you're going to get the areas cancel out and you find that the pressure exerted by a liquid depends on the height of the liquid, the density of the liquid, and the acceleration due to gravity. Does the pressure depend on the shape of the container? Let's find out. So here we have uh, two different containers filled with the same liquid to the same height. What about the pressures at A and B, which are two points at the bottom? It will be the same. Why is the pressure same? Because it's the same liquid, the density is the same. They are to the same height and that's all that matters. So be careful. It does not depend on the quantity of the liquid. So if you go into a lake uh, at a certain depth, it doesn't matter that the lake contains so much more water. If you are at the same depth as in the case of these two containers, you can be sure that the pressure is the same. All right, let's move on. So when you calculate the pressure, always use H rho G. And I, I just wanted to find the pressure at the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean, which is called the Mariana Strange. And there the depth is 11 kilometers or 11,000 meters. So how do you find the pressure? It's uh, 11,000 multiplied by the density of seawater is 1,025. If it was fresh water, it would be 1,000. But because it's seawater, it's 1,025. And when you multiply those quantities, you get this huge pressure. That explains why you cannot go to the bottom of the ocean without some kind of protective gear. All right, if you go there, you will be crushed. Remember that one tor is 133 pascals. One tor is 133 pascals. So what is the atmospheric pressure? 
we don't even feel the atmospheric pressure, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. The atmospheric pressure exists because we are at the bottom of an ocean of air and it's so uh, very high above. I know that the density of air decreases as you go higher, but on the average taking the density of air, uh, we can find the atmospheric pressure. But this is the experiment done by Torricelli. So he took a big tube containing uh, mercury, filled it with mercury, and then inverted it into a trough, another container having mercury in it. After carefully closing the uh, opening, you know, with something. And then he let go. Once it was inside the mercury, he let go. And you guess what happened? The, all of the mercury did not come flowing down into the container. No, it didn't. It came down every time up to 76 centimeters and stopped. So Torricelli was trying to demonstrate that something is holding a 76 centimeter of mercury column right there. It's supporting, what is that? That is the atmospheric pressure acting through the liquid and supporting its weight. So today we know that the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by 76 centimeters of mercury. And we can calculate that. Only got to change 76 into meter here, multiply with the density of mercury and you get this huge number. 101.325 Newton per meter squared or Pascals. Roughly 10 to the power 5 Pascals, that's a lot. But whenever you try to calculate the actual pressure or the absolute pressure, we always have to consider there is atmospheric pressure. For example, when you try to measure the pressure in a tire, we use a tire pressure gauge. We do. Now, the reading given by the pressure gauge is not the actual pressure inside the tire. What it shows is what is over and above the atmospheric pressure. So if you want to get the total pressure in the tire, you got to add the atmospheric pressure. And that is called the absolute pressure. Therefore, absolute pressure is the atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure. Now, why is it called the gauge pressure? Because it's measured by the gauge. Okay, Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle is that a liquid transmits pressure equally in all directions. A liquid transmits pressure equally in all directions. Now that is why we are able to use brake fluid. Because when you apply that pressure on the brake pedal, the liquid, which is the brake fluid, transmits the pressure equally onto the four wheels. So that is Pascal's principle, but it's, it's also used in a hydraulic jack, you know, used to lift cars, you know, so easily. So here is the principle of the hydraulic jack. You have two cylinders, one smaller cross section, the other bigger, uh, connected together, of course, and filled with a liquid. And if you apply a pressure little f on the smaller area, the pressure there is going to be little f by a and then the force acting on the bigger piston on the other side would be caps f. Therefore, the pressure would be caps f by caps a. But according to Pascal's principle, the pressures are equal. Therefore, I put the two pressures equal to each other, rearrange that and automatically you see that we get a bigger force. And how many times is the force going to be magnified? It's going to be magnified as many times as the ratio of the areas of the cylinders. So if you have a tiny area, tiny cylinder, you apply a small force, you could translate that into a much bigger force by using a bigger area on the other side. And that is used in the hydraulic jack and the brake systems and, and many other practical uses. So remember that. 
Let's move on to one of the most important ideas in fluids, which is called Archimedes principle. Archimedes story, you got to read that. Uh, that's, uh, you know, his story. At the end of the story, he cries out, Eureka, Eureka, which means I have found it. I have found it. All right, read the story on your own. But uh, Archimedes principle basically talks about the buoyant force exerted by a liquid when you put a solid in it. So you take a solid and put it into a liquid. It may float or it may sink. But in either case, the liquid is exerting an upward force, which is called the upthrust or the buoyant force. And we're going to calculate the buoyant force. According to Archimedes principle, the buoyant force will be exactly equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Write that down. The buoyant force will be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So that depends on the density of the fluid now. So if it's a denser liquid, then for the same volume, you're going to displace a bigger weight. That's why it's easier for solids to float in a liquid that has a bigger density. Um, so if a boat moves from the ocean into a river, or maybe from a river into an ocean, either way, from a river into the ocean, will the boat sink down further or will it get lifted up a little bit? What do you think? Well, of course, the density of sea water is bigger. Therefore, as the boat enters the sea, it will not have to sink as much as it was in the river in order to balance its own weight. I hope that made sense. That also means that whenever anything floats, the weight of the floating object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So the ship in the ocean will go down into the water until it balances its own weight. Or in other words, the weight of the ocean water displaced is equal to the weight of the ship. So now we know it has to go down a lot into the ocean. So here is Archimedes principle coming up. You know, we calculate the pressure at A. A is at a depth of H1. So the pressure is H1 rho G. And so the force at A is that multiplied by the area, which is little a. Similarly, the pressure at B is a h2 rho g, and h2 is bigger. Uh, that, that's the force, actually, a h2 rho g. And so you see that there is a difference in the forces. Down, it's pushing up. On top, it's pushing down. So there is a net force upwards, and you find that by taking the difference. When you take the difference, you get it to be A rho G, the common terms taken out, H2 minus H1. What is H2 minus H1? H2 minus H1 is the height of the solid. And therefore, we know that the net force up is equal to A H rho G. Now look carefully. A times H. A times H is the volume, isn't it? Yes, A times H is the volume of the solid. Rho is the density of the liquid times G. So if a solid is completely immersed in a liquid, it displaces its own volume because the whole volume is under. And so the volume of the solid times the density of the liquid times G. So that's, that's one confusion. Got to be careful that it's not the density of the solid Instead, it's the density of the fluid because we're trying to find the weight of the fluid displaced. This is the weight of the fluid displaced. Take note of that. Do not make a mistake there. I've already mentioned the law of flotation. 
that is the weight of the floating object should be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by it. So if anything is floating, it should be able to balance its own weight. Okay, so that's what is shown there. FB is the uh, buoyant force acting up. MG is the weight of the object acting down. If they are both equal, then they are, I mean, the object is going to float. So here I am just trying to work out a problem. I'm trying to find out, uh, you know, when an air bubble rises from the bottom of a lake, for example, and comes to the top, the air bubble is going to become bigger. And the reason is, at the bottom, the pressure is higher. And so the volume is smaller. It's being compressed. And when it comes to the surface, uh, the pressure becomes lower, so it becomes bigger. This is actually Boyle's law. I hope some of you remember. To calculate it, all we got to do is, according to Boyle's law, the product of pressure and volume is a constant. So that's what I've done here. Pressure times volume at A, where A is at the bottom, is pressure times volume at the surface. Now, what is the pressure at the bottom? Remember, there is atmospheric pressure at the bottom because the liquid transmits the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure at the bottom is the atmospheric pressure plus H rho G, which is the hydrostatic pressure. H is the height of the liquid times uh, the volume at A is equal to, on the surface, you only have the atmospheric pressure times the volume at the surface. When you do the math, you see that if you assume that the, the volume at the surface is twice that at the bottom, which is what I've done, I've taken this to be two times VA, then you can cancel the VAs and then do the math and find the height of that lake or pond. You know, you couldn't call this a lake because the height or depth is only 10.33 meter. So that's how you could apply uh, pressure with Boyle's law to do calculations. This again means that we have to be very careful when we use those weather balloons because as they start rising up into the atmosphere, Guess what? The pressure decreases as you go up and, and the volume would increase and there is a big chance that they would simply burst. And that's obviously what happens to helium balloons if you let them go into the atmosphere and they're going to burst at a certain height and then boom, what's remaining hits the ground. Hope that makes sense. So here is the next topic, the equation of continuity. Simple topic. It, it just uh, talks about a fluid flowing through a pipe that has a, a certain cross section. And if it's flowing with an average velocity V bar, which is d by t, you know, we can show that the quantity of fluid flowing per second, Q, stands for the volume of fluid flowing per second, which is V by T, that's going to be A times D because A times D is the volume divided by T and then D by T becomes the average velocity. Or in other words, to find the volume of any liquid flowing per second through a pipe, all you got to do is multiply the area of cross section with the average flow velocity. Multiply the area of cross-section with the average flow velocity. So rate of flow is A times average velocity. And I just wanted to sh tell you that blood in the human body flows at an average rate of 5 liters per minute. Okay. Uh, so remember that Q and average velocity are different, although they are related. Q is the volume flowing in a second. V bar is the speed or velocity of flow. So from there, uh, what happens if a, a liquid flows through a tube that has different area of cross sections? 
Well, for sure we know that when it comes to the narrow section, it's going to flow faster. We know that. But how are the speeds and area of cross sections related? Well, we know that the volume flowing per second through both must be the same. Therefore, A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. That's it. A1 times V1 is equal to A2 times V2. What does that mean? That means if A1 is greater than A2, then V1 is less than V2. In other words, wherever it's narrow, it flows faster. And this uh, comes about directly from the conservation of mass because uh, a liquid practically cannot be compressed and so the densities are equal. So I put row 1 and row 2 and uh, if they are equal, they can be cancelled out. On the other hand, if you're talking about applying conservation of uh, mass to a flowing gas, then you know that the densities would be different. So then you will have to use the entire formula considering row 1 and row 2 to be different at the two different points. Well, next we come to a very important uh, idea influence called Bernoulli's principle now this is the principle that explains how an airplane is able to have a lift how an airplane with all those passengers and the luggage is able to float in the sky and move it explains why a spinning ball turns or curves you know in baseball depending on the type of spin it could curve either way anyway so we're going to look at that, but let's first find what Bernoulli's principle is. It's chiefly conservation of energy. We've already studied about potential energy and kinetic energy. When a fluid flows, you know, just, uh, you know, if it flows in a tube that's either inclined up or down, we know that the height is changing, so the potential energy changes, right? And the kinetic energy will also change. So a flowing fluid has potential energy and kinetic energy. But it also has a third type of energy called pressure energy. And pressure energy is given by the product of pressure and volume. Now the sum total of all these three energies must be the same at every point. That is Bernoulli's principle. The total of potential energy kinetic energy and pressure energy must be the same at every point in the flow. I've, I've given an application of Bernoulli's principle here uh, and then we will get the formula. You know, this shows a tiny car driving near an 18-wheeler and um, in the gap between the two vehicles you see that the air is going to move much faster. And according to Bernoulli's principle, I'm going to prove that where the speed is higher, the pressure is lower. Where the speed is higher, the pressure is always lower. And so it's dangerous. Since the pressure between the two becomes less, there's a, every chance that this tiny car get, could get sucked uh, towards that 18-wheeler if driving very close. So be careful when you try. So consider a pipe as shown in the diagram. Uh, it's uh, kind of inclined up. The height is H1 and at the uh, left hand side and H2 at the right side. And the flow velocities are V1 and V2. So here are the three energies together and I told you according to the conservation of energy they must be the sum must be a constant. So you have mgh plus one half mv squared plus p times volume. That part, the third one, is the pressure energy, is a constant. Now if you divide by mass uh, throughout, mathematically the equation would be correct because on the right side, dividing a constant by a mass, which is also a constant, will give you another constant. But on the left hand side, mass times uh, mass divided by volume becomes density. 
Here again, mass by volume is density and here the volume gets cancelled. So this is the equation that we get from Bernoulli's principle. So rho g h plus one half rho v squared plus pressure is constant. But you'll have to remember that there are some conditions where you can apply this. The flow must be streamlined, not turbulent. That means it should be a smooth flow. Not the flow in a flooded river. Instead, the flow through a tiny tube. It should be a streamlined flow. Only, and only then can you apply Bernoulli's principle. And usually you're going to be asked problems where the tube is like horizontal. If the, if the pipe or tube is horizontal, then the potential energies are equal. So you can ignore that term. And therefore, you will only consider the two terms. Rho GH plus half Rho V squared is a constant. Now, if that's the case, then you know, look at this. Then you know that if the flow velocity here in the narrow pipe, you know, it's, it's going to be higher. If that's higher, according to this equation, the pressure there must be lower. Yep. That's why the main idea is wherever the speed of flow is higher, the pressure is going to be lower. How can we use that to explain the lift of an airplane? An airplane has wings, not for decorative purposes, but if you look at the shape of the wing, on top it will be rounded and at the bottom of the wing it will be flat. And the picture shown here illustrates that. Here it's flat at the bottom and rounded on the top. The idea is that when the aircraft taxis on the runway, as the air hits the wing, it divides into two parts. One part flowing underneath, the other part flowing above. And because the part above is curved, it's a longer distance for the air to reach the other end, while at the bottom it, it's a smaller distance. According to the equation of continuity, what separates here? Whatever mass separates here must recombine at the other side, which means that the part that is flowing over the wing has to move faster in order to reach at the same time. I hope that makes sense. So wherever the flow velocity is higher, the pressure is what is lower. That means as long as the aircraft is moving, the pressure on top of the wing is going to be less. So it gets a lift up on the wing. And since the, the area of the wing is big, the force, which is the product of the pressure and the area, actually the pressure difference and the area, is able to support the weight of the aircraft, the passengers, and all the cargo in it. So that is the idea. So here I'm making a, a small calculation, trying to explain the same thing again. As you can see the calculation, I already mentioned, if P1 is the pressure on top, P2 is the pressure at the bottom, P2 is bigger. So when you take the difference in pressure, multiplied with the area, you get the difference in force, which is equal to the weight of the whole thing. And then we are able to bring in Bernoulli's principle and we know that P2 minus P1 is given by this. So we can set that equal to mg. Why does a, a spinning ball curve? So when you throw the ball and let's assume that it's not spinning at first. If it's just going straight like not spinning. The air flows backwards one part over the ball and the other below. And since the ball is not spinning, the speed of airflow, both on top and bottom, will be the same. So there is no difference in speeds and there's no difference in pressure. But when the ball spins, and usually, you know, it spins clockwise, you throw it that way. 
when it spins the air around the ball also spins in the same direction the air around the ball spins in the same direction All right so that look at the airflow the red arrows show the airflow due to the spin and if you look carefully now you see that on top the airflow due to the two motions are opposite but down below you see that the airflow due to the two motions are in the same direction what are the two motions one is the forward motion the other is the spin that means since the streamlines are in the same direction at the base at the bottom the speed of flow at the bottom is going to be higher where the speed is higher the pressure is lower therefore the ball curves well we know that due to the effect of gravity it's going to curve but now it curves even more so I was trying to show that this would have been the path taken if the ball was not spinning. Now it's spinning, so it curves even more and takes that path. And if this is baseball, the batter swings above the ball and misses it. That's the whole idea. Well, with a lot of practice, you would be able to hit the ball still, but that would take a lot of practice. And again, remember that the ball need not be spinning uh, like that, like the spin axis need not be horizontal, it could spin diagonally, then that brings in a different effect now. So it's quite difficult uh, to judge where the ball is going to come at. That's why 95 or could be 99% of the time the batters miss the ball. Well, there are other reasons too.